G'day. Pull that a bit down there. That's me. I'm Dan. Um, I'm head of design at a little thing called Up. Pretty excited to be given the opportunity to come here and talk a little bit around what we've done. Um, I'll just get a quick read on the room. Who here has heard of Up? Oh, wow. Awesome. And how many of you are customers? All right. I'm going to try and convert the rest of you by the end of this chat. We'll see how we go. <clears throat> uh, the title of today's talk is Designing Superpowered Banking. So for everyone that doesn't know what UP is, we're Australia's first neobank. Um, we launched about a year ago to the week. Um, and since then, just yesterday, one o'clock, we ticked over 150,000 um, customers. So uh, it's a really exciting project to be working on. I remember when we were celebrating the 1,000 user milestone, it was worth a couple of beers and a pub lunch. And, um, and now we're kind of doing that day on day, which is, um, speaks to a lot of the growth and how it's resonating with everyone. Up to collaboration between two companies. So Ferocious is the company I work for. It's a small independent software company in um, South Melbourne. Uh, there's about 40 of us, and we're mostly designers and engineers. And Bendigo Bank, I'm sure most of you have heard of. Their biggest bank outside the big four, a publicly traded company, and there's about one and a half million users. So it's a really interesting dynamic be between these two. But it goes really well. Like it, um, the relationship goes beyond up. Um, and a year ago, we've actually built Bendigo's banking mobile and banking platform for the last five years. That's kind of how we learnt the ropes. And um, this partnership keeps going from strength to strength. We won a Finney for this partnership this year in 2019. And there's a lot of ways to slice 150,000, all the data around that. But the one that's most interesting in regards to ARP is probably the age cohorts. So here we've got a graph um, of the age, a histogram of all the ages from 16 right through to 70. And you can see that 80% of our user base sits between 16 and 35 years old. And that's not an accident. That was definitely an objective when we launched to target generations X, Y, and Z. Um, I think initially, even the shape of that graph is pretty interesting. It's sort of skewing more to the left now. But when we first started off with all the early adopters um, and everyone in family and friends and in tech, the average age was around 27 and 28. And then as time goes on, now our top age group is 19 years old. And the average age, or sorry, the median age is around 24. And I think initially this had a lot to do with the product offering, but then more so as time's gone on, I think the brand's starting to really resonate with a lot of people. Um, to try and quickly summarise where the impetus of UP came from, speaking to one of the old timers at Ferocia and sort of trying to get a grasp on uh, where did this ambition come from to try and reinvent banking. And um, our head of product, Anson Parker, summarised it really eloquently that after working with banking software for a number of years, um, he said this was kind of the sentiment of the team as a whole. It was like, what could a banking platform look like if it was built from scratch using the best capabilities and technologies? And that's a question, right? But it's kind of inferred that there was sort of a frustration from the team after a number of years of really wrestling with the legacy core banking platforms that banking um, is really inundated with. And um, it always kind of speaks to how banking is set up from the back end and how it can be abstract abstracted forward rather than what does the user want? So we've seen this happen a few times before, and it was mentioned this morning in Malcolm Turnbull's um, opening address, which was really cool, that there's been a few industries that have been caught off guard in this regard. Um, the notable ones are probably Airbnb and hotels, Amazon bookstores, um, and what Netflix came in and did to the DVD rental industry. Um, but the one that we're all really familiar with is probably this one. And I won't go into heaps of detail, but I've got a personal anecdote around um, how Uber launched, particularly in Australia. Um, I was in a co-working space many years ago, um, and yeah, Uber was launching in Australia. They had these little satellite teams in each state, and being that we were interested in tech, this was a long time ago, actually. The Aracon actually looked like this back then. It was just Uber Black. This is before they launched UberX. So we're talking 2012, and um, we had heard a bit of the buzz around how Uber was killing it in the States, and we were sort of watching from a distance in the office with a bit of curiosity how they were going to go about launching it in Australia. And they were really friendly guys, and they used to hand us these vouchers to give to family and friends. And I remember um, trying to hand these vouchers out to my mates and not doing a really good job of explaining what Uber was. Um, they kind of squinted at me and said, uh, hang on. So I get in a car with a stranger, and it takes me to a destination that I enter in on my phone. I just butchered it, basically. But it's not until you use the experience firsthand from a user-centric perspective that you start having a lot of these aha moments around how Uber worked and how it approached the market. They pioneered this crosshair interface. And you just go, oh, of course, I should be able to drop the pin exactly where I want to be picked up. Of course, I should be able to see an estimation of what that fare will be. Of course, I'll see a photo of the driver, their car, their rating, how far away they are. 
and of course I should be able to see a listing of all the trips that I've had with this platform. It just makes a lot of sense, right, looking back. And I think, or we think pretty strongly that in the next 12 to 18 months, a similar shift's gonna happen with banking in Australia. We've just gotten really used to a pretty, um, without throwing mud, like a pretty poor standard of what's acceptable from a user-centric approach. And so it's not unusual to log into your online banking and see a transaction like this. It doesn't happen a lot, but every now and then you'll just sort of be given enough information to just try and work out, like, what the hell is this? You've got a date, got a raw text description. Sometimes these FBOS machines are set up pretty poorly, or it's a dodgy ABN, something like that. <coughs> but essentially, the way up's set up is that as soon as you open the app, you don't see a list of the financial products that you've got with that bank. You've got an activity feed. And something that you probably won't notice, but it's pretty important is you see timestamps. Like, why don't banks do timestamps? It's incredible context. So if I'm looking at that and it's saying, oh, 1.04 p.m., cool, that's lunch. I should be able to tap on that. I should be able to see a logo of the merchant. I should be able to see a suburb. I should be able to tap insights and see all my history with this merchant. I ate a lot of Nando's. Um, 9.45 is the tenderloin deal. Anyway, so it, it, just, it seems obvious looking at it from this perspective, right? So why have we gotten so used to um, not having our banking experiences designed in this way. And so I'm going to talk through about four chunks of work um, that we've approached, or designed, ideated, and executed. And they're the sign up and onboarding flow, FAR, uh, the, welcome, uh, the card design, and the welcome pack experience. This is something that we, we're becoming quite well known for as time goes on. This one's a funny feature called pull to save. Excited to talk about that. It's a, it'll be a bit of a change of gears. It's a pretty funny one. And the last thing I'm going to chat about is how we've approached payments. So first cap off the rank being the sign-up flow. It's pretty common practice to be building a feature like this if you're building any app from scratch. But um, we started off with a pretty hairy, audacious goal. Allow users to download, install the app, and have a bank account in under five minutes. It was a pretty arbitrary goal that was just plucked out of thin air. Um, the way it was sold to the team was actually with a bit of storytelling. It was like, imagine if someone saw some up promo in a cafe, and they were able to download, install the app, go through the flow, verify their identity, have a promotion, 10 bucks into the account, and then be able to provision an Apple Pay or Google Pay. And by the time they get to the front of the line, be able to buy a coffee with that funding. And so have an end-to-end -end user experience um, by like a really fast um, sign-up flow. And so we did what designers do, and we sort of got it all out there. It's, opening a bank account through your phone is pretty tough. It's not like other platforms where you just get away with the username, email, and password. It's you know, government regulated and guaranteed, so you've got to go through this whole rigmarole, which is good rigor, and you've got to do KYC, know your customer, verify your identity. And we got it all out there, and we really sort of tried to trim the fat. We don't ask questions that we don't, they're irrelevant. We don't ask for your gender. We tried to consolidate a lot of the screens into um, simple screens if it was possible. Sort of essentially got to this layout, which is not unusual. It's, we didn't invent any of this, but it's pretty common for sign up flows to look something like this. We prototyped it, we launched it to family and friends, and um, we've got this obsession with um, feed, the feedback loop and being able to approve things. So we just noticed real small one percenters, um, ways we could improve it. And um, so we moved to more of a typographic layout. We thought the iconography on each screen, which is a common thing that designers try and do for each screen, but the cognitive load of your eyes darting around and trying to find yourself was a bit tricky. Um, small things like increasing the call to action to full width, anchoring it to the top of the viewport so it's close to the thumb. Um, smart placeholder text. I don't know, you can see just the kind of detail that we go to when we're trying to optimize this flow. Um, also, the conversational text, instead of just saying name, date of birth, like what is your name? Just little touches like that that help ease people through the flow with as little resistance as possible. We got to the end and um, we used to just get to you to a summary screen, agree and submit, and we go off and check your identity, and then we used to just chuck you straight in the app. And again, through that iteration and feedback, we realized, oh, it's just lacking something. It's lacking a bit of personality, a bit of brand. It's just been this intense data capture experience, and we were just trying to rush you into the, um, into the app. And I like to think, looking back, we didn't think, I don't recall, remember th uh, thinking this at the time, but we probably borrowed a bit of inspiration from MailChimp. Seeing a few nods in the crowd, people have done um, email campaigns before. They're a pretty stressful event. Um, again, a lot of data capture involved, and before sending them off, emails are tricky. Once they're out, you can't pull them back. So MailChimp would inject these kind of emotive, um, I suppose, brand touch points. You know, the stress before you hit the red button, the high five moment when your campaign goes out, or if you scheduled it, this sort of rock on. We love this stuff. So we tried to come up something with something ourselves, and 
we worked with Pete Johnson, a creative director, who came up with this little animation. It's really simple. It's nothing earth shattering. Pretty much just welcomed her up. You're now an upsider. And the response to this was really positive. People were sharing this. They felt like they just they, they joined something quite new and fresh. They're just not expecting this in banking, I suppose, or any kind of this attention to the emotive experience. It's a celebra celebratory moment. So we started to learn a bit about the brand, not just as a, from a product perspective, but um, the tone of voice and yeah, what was really resonating with these demographics that we targeted. We were really starting to lean into this. So even on the configuration screens, we're doing little touches like this. Empty states. Sort of, you could see the, the illustrative sort of um, aesthetic was really starting to evolve in this direction. Um, and then when, after about 20,000 users, we wanted a big enough sample size to really know if we smashed our goal and we absolutely obliterated it. We ended up getting the average sign up time to two minutes and 18 seconds. That's not a personal best, that's an average. Um, and that's like on average somewhere between 35 screens you'll go through. So it's a pretty slick process. Um, if anyone doesn't believe me, you can try it now. If you scan this QR code, I've set up a coupon code that you can use StartCon and you'll get 10 bucks straight into your account straight away. Um, if you don't have time to do it now, I'm gonna flash this screen at the end of the talk. The second thing I wanted to chat about was the welcome pack and the card design. Uh, this was one we earmarked pretty early that we really wanted to uh, smash it out of the park because your brand touch points when you're a digital bank, they're pretty much all digital, which is fine for us because that's in our wheelhouse. We love software, tech and interaction, but um, the only sort of one that exists in the real world is receiving your card. There's a few others potentially if you get statements and stuff like that, but we're a branchless bank. so. We wanted to use this point to really prove that this wasn't just a software product play, that we really are from a company objective trying to reimagine banking. So we, and we knew if we did it in a, in a good way, is a couple of examples that, particularly with this generation, they would share it. Um, there's YouTube channels dedicated to unboxing experiences. It's nuts and they have millions of subscribers and I watch a few of them, but, um, W there was a theory that we could probably catch people off guard because they're just not expecting this from a bank. So we really went after it. Um, so like all good design processes, we started sort of examining the current state of affairs. We visited these factories that produce cards and mail them out for you. Um, we got taken on a tour. We kept asking, can we do this? Can we do this? Can we do this? And it soon became apparent. They weren't getting frustrated, but they just, they're pretty much the point they were trying to make to us is anytime you veer off the beaten path in this regard, it's gonna cost you a lot of money. This factory is optimized completely to produce one thing. And it's that. It's a PVC card stuck with that gross glue on an A4 piece of paper, tri-folded and then shoved in a DL envelope that's windowed. So they don't even have to customize that. They can just reuse the name that you've... You can reverse engineer from this outcome that the, the goal is what's the most cost efficient way to get this card in our customer's hands. Um, and this, this slide's a couple of years old, actually. It's probably fair of me to update it to the latest artwork, but the point's still valid. In terms of card design, we, we thought the branding across the incumbents was pretty weak. Um, it was a good opportunity for some design cut through. Um, we were pretty obsessed early with this idea of having a vertical card. So I um, wasn't gonna mention this, but you'll probably notice in the last six months, vertical cards are kind of everywhere at the moment, but we started this process back in 2000 and August 2017, and this is all we could find on the internet in regards to vertical cards. Um, but we, we weren't deterred. We, we worked closely with MasterCard and they were great. We, this is a real page turner. This is a hundred page document on card design standards for MasterCard and we had to learn it back to front. And we were emailing them every few days. Can we do this? Can we do this? Can we do this? And they were, they would always take a day or two to respond. I think they themselves had to check within their rules of some of the ideas that we had around vertical cards and just to plot it out. We just wanted to rotate the form factor, sort of plop on everything that's a non-negotiable that has to go on there. And going back to the original goal, we wanted this to be shareable, right? So you can't really have that sensitive information on the front of the card, the expiry date, the PIN number. Um, you could come up with a mechanism, like a sticker or like a something to cover it, but we went one better and we asked, can we check this on the back of the card? And they said, yeah, that should be right. And then um, we found like a new nano SIM technology that we were keen to sort of roll out in this to sort of make it look a bit slicker on the front. We researched that that magnetic strip, there's a couple of tracks from there that aren't being used anymore. So we've got four mil back there. Um, but you can see this is the kind of um, attention to detail and rigor that we apply to almost anything that we execute. And here's the evolution of the card. You can see where it starts to stand up for the first time. And then got sort of the latest versions of fluoro core color. It looks amazing. Um, 
this was a painful process. So software, you can have an idea in the morning and you can be prototyping it by the afternoon. Each one of these steps took about three or four months with the minimum order quantities and the scale of economy. So it was just a very, um, yeah, intense, we, we just had to really keep our eye on the prize and keep marching towards it. Uh, and then we moved to package design. So we pretty much immersed ourselves in stuff that we like the look of. If you go on Pinterest and type hipster package design, you get this stuff for like days. <laughs> Um, we started getting really uh, into sort of, I suppose, texture and stock. Um, and so it's a big part of our process. We, we got attached pretty early actually to Letterpress. Um, and we we're mentioning this with a, our, our Letterpress printer, Tailored Press. They're based in Melbourne. They're unreal. Um, and they thought we were a bit mad. They're like, there's no way you can produce this process at scale in the ways that you want. Um, but we got there um, through collaborating with them. They helped us devise this mechanism. It's Dell's um, form factor, but we wanted to be able to fix the card without that gross glue that I mentioned before. So we came up with this sort of slide mechanism. This stock is triplexed, so there's three layers there. We thought it was cute to sort of have the card activation and pin number setting um, instructions behind the card. Uh, these are the machines that are used to apply the letterpress. They're called Heidelberg machines. They were um, they were made before World War II, and it's still apparently the most efficient way to achieve letterpress. But we worked very closely with this printer to achieve sort of the scale of economies that we were after. And this is what we ended up with. It really, it's gone through about four or five iterations of artwork, um, but you can, you can see what I mean by people aren't expecting to receive something like this when they've just signed up to a bank. And share it, they did. So every day we're getting, I mean, it was an incredibly val validating feeling seeing the first um, examples of these roll through. But it just talks a little bit around the stimulus that's available, the opportunity to really go above and beyond and delight your customers. And probably a lot of you are thinking, all right, how much does it cost? And the, the most recent um, version of this, the last order of 30,000 of these, um, we've got it within seven, only just a 7% increment on, on top of what the traditional banking pack was. That's how tight we were able to drive all the margins. And so, um, I mean, in many ways, obviously it's more than the, um, that original traditional pack that I've pointed out at the start of this talk, but we almost consider this a marketing spend given how often people share it. And all our really enthusiastic users are doing a lot of marketing on our behalf because of this. <coughs> Third thing I want to talk about is called pull to save. This one's, uh, I just I really enjoy talking about this. The first two things I spoke about, they're, non, they're table stakes, right? You've got to have a sign up flow and you've got to deliver your card. No one asked for this next feature. <laughs> And essentially it came, I'll, I'll explain sort of the three things that led to it. Um, we have Roundups enabled in um, our, our app. And basically what that is, for those that don't know, is when you make a transfer, uh, when you make a, when you pay for something, it rounds it up to the nearest dollar. And that difference is chucked in a high interest saver. It's just a cool way to just aggregately save some money. And what it kind of, a, a side effect of that is on the activity feed, you've got all these nice round, whole, whole rounded numbers. And it sort of makes you look at the balance and go, I wish I could do something with that 78 cents to sort of get it into the savers. So that was sort of a notion that was floating around the office. Another notion that um, came about our head of products, he spoke a little bit around that habit that we have when we um, come home after a big night out and you empty your pockets into that jar with all the, all the loose change that you have. He's like, that's a habitual saving behavior. It'd be cool if we could replicate that somehow in the digital medium. So that was knocking about. And the third piece of the puzzle was we just removed this interaction from the app. It's called Pull to Refresh. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. Um, it was invented in 2010 by an app called Tweety. And it's a good way, you, you'll use it in a lot of apps. If, you're, if you want to reload, you'll just pull to refresh. And this is slowly being phased out of apps because of a thing called silent push notifications. Um, think of it like mailing apps when you used to have to send and receive, but then all of a sudden things just started popping in your inbox. So this all, I imagine, will eventually be phased out the next few years. So we had this interaction that was freed up that's pretty ubiquitous and pretty discoverable. So we're like, let's, let's try and mash these three things together. <coughs> we worked pretty closely with the front enders to produce this prototype. As you've probably seen so far, prototyping is a really powerful way of um, getting enthusiasm and buy-in from all the people that have to collaborate on it. And so um, we were just working on this thing. Oh, if we pull down on the screen, we can draw the focus towards the sense. And then that available t label can become more instructional. For those that can't see it, it sort of says, um, keep pulling. And if you go a bit further, it says um, release to save. And so we worked again with our creative director to sort of inject a little bit of the brand into this experience. So he was thinking, oh, maybe we could use bolts to zap it. 
maybe we could put the sense in a coin and flick that off the screen. It was a very collaborative process. One of the engineers said, oh, if we flick it off the screen, we gotta, there's got to be high affordance. We have to tell people where it went. So like, wouldn't it be cool if it fell into the savers section and splashed like it was falling on a... Yeah, no, no idea is too crazy at this point. And so we ran with it, and this is what we ended up with. And it's just a cute little thing. It just chucks 75 cents into a high interest saver. Um, it was a lot of fun to build, but again, no one asked for it. But it was just, I suppose the point I'm trying to make is there was an opportunity there to balance with all this table stakes work that we were doing, all these features like BPay, scheduled payments, automatic, all this kind of stuff that we're knocking out every day. It was good to sort of fit into that we're a small team, so you've got to be careful what you focus on, but we were able to sneak in an opportunity to, um, I suppose, express to the users that we really care about this stuff. Um, when we when we first announced it, people were going a little bit berserk on Twitter with it, just saying how much they loved it, which was a great relief. <laughs> um, there's some funny discussions around it. Some people were using the word gamifying saving, uh, which, to be honest, didn't really come up with, j during any of the build of it, but we were happy to sort of take that as an observation. One guy here says, that was all it took for me to switch banks, so his barrier is pretty low. Um, <laughs> There's another one there that's pretty funny. We, we, we got gun shy and we installed this, or we set this $10 limit. So if your balance was less than $10, we'd disable it. Just because we didn't really want people running all the way down to zero. And this person was cracking it. He's like, um, he said, you allow me to do it as much as I want. If this is my primary way of moving money into my saver, I should be allowed to do it. So we rolled that back, just based on that tweet. <laughs> Uh, yeah, within its first couple of months, it was just being, obviously, as you can imagine, it was really discoverable. So people were just discovering it for the first time. So the real metric that we sort of paid attention was reuse once they found it. But um, it boosted the roundups amount in that period by tenfold. So it was an incredibly positive um, behavior that we were sort of encouraging. And the last thing I'll talk about is payments. Uh, this is a bit of a funny one because um, we actually launched without payments. So. We'd, we'd sort of locked into the decision to use OSCO and MPP as our default payments network, and we were having a few roadblocks with that, and we didn't want to push back the launch date of November last year, so we went live, and all you could do was fund your account and, um, and buy stuff. And so you can imagine the daily feedback that we were getting around how important it was that we get payments out, and so, which is fair enough. And, um, and we would have been forgiven for shipping something that looked a little like this. This is what we call the pay anyone flow, and all banks do it. Pretty much you hit, I want to make a new payment. You go, all right, name, BSB account number, and off you go. And a lot of banks have contact management systems where um, you select a contact, and it's pretty much filling out all this stuff anyway. It's like a shortcut. But we, we've been working in banking a while, and we had this notion that um, when people pay you and when you pay them, banks treat that no differently from anything else in your statement. So someone paying you is a deposit, and you paying someone else is a debit. It makes sense, right? But there's often, we know that there's a lot of context happening around these transfers, uh, sorry, these payments to, from you and your friends. And so the notion kind of arrived that really payments are a conversation. We know that you're discussing each one of these payments in another platform, whether it be WhatsApp, Messenger, um, whatever it is. So we wanted to try and come up with a solution that was more embedded into the platform that supported this mental model that people were using when they were talking about payments. And so. Again, we came up with some prototypes and wireframes. It was like, oh, it'd be cool to have a payment section in the app where it's kind of sorted by recent activity. Because when someone pays you, it's hard for you to know when was the last time they paid me. Um, so we'll just attach to this idea that it'd be cool to group that kind of stuff. And if you tap on it, it's this very common interface that, um, if you think of it, about it actually, these generations that we're targeting, the 19 year olds to 24 year olds, they're, they're using interfaces, this chatting interface pretty much all day, every day whether it's Snapchat, Messenger, like whatever it is, they're very familiar with this paradigm. And so we're just trying to see where it fit in terms of a banking payment um, feature. So you'd have a, an input that has an amount and um, you'd have a chat field, which we're obviously just reusing the description field from the payments network. And then the, the real payoff is eventually arriving here, having a contact and being able to see all that context with each payment in one place. Um, it's a cool demo, but um, the payments um, payments infrastructure doesn't work like this. It's easy when you make a payment because you've got all the information. You can just hit a big plus button and you can go through this whole flow. You can fill it out. This is a prototype. This is not actually out. This is a very early prototype, actually. And then you fill the form out and you send payment. And that's going to create a thread because we've got the contact name and it's going to just chuck that payment in there. That's the easy part because we're in control of all that. The hairiness comes in when uh, money comes in from someone else. 
you've got a little text description. Sometimes it'll be their name, sometimes it'll be DC Wern, sometimes all banks do this differently. So there's no real standard way of knowing exactly when payments come in, what to do with it. We could have done some fuzzy matching, um, but and we could have actually given up on this entire feature there because the mappings just aren't there. But um, when, you've, when you've got a strong vision towards something and you still want to be backwards compatible with an existing framework, sometimes compromises have to be made. And we ended up going with um, sort of this little thing down the bottom called identify this payment. It's a similar pattern to what we use when you make transfer, uh, sorry, when you pay for something at a merchant we don't know. We sort of ask you to help us identify it. But in terms of this payment, you can, there's three things that you can do with it. It's either me funding my account, or I can assign it to an existing up contact if there's an existing thread, or it's a completely new contact. And so in this instance here, I've paid this person before, so I'm just gonna search them through my contacts. And pretty much I'm just gonna map that payment to that thread so that any more payments that come in from this person, it's gonna come in here. And the big payoff is the low barrier to be able to just hit that send money button, have the payment draw come up, fill it out. OSCO supports 255 characters and emojis, which is, which is pretty cool. And essentially, this is how easy we think payments should be to the people that you constantly send money to. <laughs> so there it is, that's conversational payments. How am I doing for time? Oh, I just snuck in there, cool. So it's a bit, bit of an abrupt finish, but uh, thanks for listening. Um, here's the sign-up code that I mentioned before. Um, thank you. <laughs>